Good evening, everyone, and welcome to everyone that's joined us online this evening as well. I'm Chris Kirk. It's my privilege to run the Startup Hub here at Lot 14. And before we kick off things tonight, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the land we meet on tonight is the land of the Ghana people, and we pay respects to elders past and present. As many of you would be familiar, Stone & Chalk is a non-for-profit that was founded to help propel entrepreneurs seeking to solve the world's most pressing challenges. And tonight, in the topic of decarbonising our economy, I couldn't think of a more pressing challenge. Challenge. This is the second in a series that we're running powered by RAA called The Future of Mobility and it's designed as a participatory session. Hopefully some of you have already filled out some of the question cards already but we will be asking questions throughout this and we'd love your input because we find that this format works best when it's a open discussion with the community so please do take part. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ben Flink, Senior Manager for Innovation at REA. Many of you would know Ben. He's been instrumental in not just setting up this series, but a range of relevant initiatives from REA. And uh, Ben will introduce our fabulous panel tonight. And uh, over to you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and welcome everyone to the event. And it's a real pleasure from an REA perspective to be hosting this Future of Mobility series. I just want to say that this tonight is a collaboration. It's a collaboration between Arup, REA, Stone and Chalk, as well as InsureTech Australia. For those of you who may be aware, InsureTech Australia is the leading, the leading association supporting the InsureTech ecosystem here in Australia. And at REA, we are delighted to be a platinum partner for InsureTech Australia, as well as collaborations such as that with Stone and Chalk, because we believe that innovation partnerships is part of our future to identify opportunities to collaborate and partner with others. Just I'd like to point out that we've got Sharice tonight who's representing both REA and InsureTech Australia. So if you want to find out more, please have a chat to Sharice. So tonight, I'll also to point out at the third part, of, a third part of this series, Future of Mobility, we're going to have the CEO from InsureTech Australia, Simone Dossiter, will be attending in person. She couldn't make it tonight, so we're looking forward to that. So tonight we're going to hear, it's going to be particip participatory, it's going to be active. We want to hear, we want you to be in there. And it's my delight to introduce three very important speakers, and we're very glad you've got the time to be here tonight. So first is Ben Haddock, who's from Arup. He's a future mobility lead and focusing on connecting energy, transport and the environment. We've also got Kerry Bowles, who is the Senior Manager of Market Development Home for RAA. And Kerry has built a strong understanding of consumer needs across energy, solar, as well as accelerating commercialisation in these categories. And then finally, a pleasure to introduce Rob Morris, who is, a, who is from IO Energy, which is a clean tech startup focusing on lowering energy bills for consumers utilising technology. So thank you. Enjoy tonight and it's my pleasure to hand over now to Anna Plummer to moderate tonight so thank you. Thanks everyone. Yep, so I'm Anna Plummer from Arup. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. I apologise, this is, I only found out this morning that I was moderating on behalf of Dan Connolly who's unfortunately unwell at home, so please bear with me. The format of today, so we've got a bit of a Mentimeter type set up on the screen here. We've got three questions for which I'll ask you to respond yes or no. And the intention of that is to raise a discussion because these questions don't have a right answer. There's a valid point for the yes, there's a valid point for the no, and it's really just about a discussion We've got three experts here who are going to be able to explore that in more detail, but again, we'd love to hear from you. So I guess the first thing to get up is if we can get the first question up on the board. Oh, this is the little QR code that you can use your phone or computer to log in with. You may have received a card when you got here with the first question on it. So the question is, are electric vehicles our primary opportunity to decarbonise SA's transport? All right, so we're hovering around the 60-40. Maybe we're pushing a little bit lower. But a few more people are saying no, but there's still a, a fair large number of you saying yes. So I'd like to hear from someone in the audience who said no up on the board. If anyone wants to raise their hand and explain their reason, we can start this conversation. Anyone said no? Yeah? I'd say the main um, rationale for my no would be to ask the question, how are the vehicles being charged? What's what is powering the power? So I guess that's, a, that's an open question. Does anyone of our panel want to answer that one? Sure thing. Hopefully I've not broken it after I dropped it the first mm -hmm. time. Yeah, it's a great response to the no argument, if you like, that we've got to understand where is the electron coming from? Otherwise, what's the point in using it? That's one polarized 
argument. The other polarised argument is electrification is better regardless of where that electron comes from. So I'm wondering if any of the other panellists have got an idea of that. But it, from, from my point of view, I'm with you in the no camp. I mean, that they're, they're not the sole primary opportunity to decarbonise the network and the transport system. Where, in the, where the electron comes from is just one of the multiple questions, but it's the important question that we need to start and should have started asking ourselves in South Australia perhaps 10 years ago. Happy to jump in about where the electron comes from. I'm probably a bit on the fence between the no and yes, but that's probably the least, I think, important part of it when we're in South Australia because we have about 70% renewable energy in the grid as it is. So even if you charge the car at random times, it's vastly better. It's about half the carbon emissions driving an EV, so internal combustion engine. And in South Australia, if you charge your car in the daytime, you're using about 90% renewable energy. And not only that, by using more daytime energy, you're supporting more solar farms to be built and getting even more renewables into the grid. So I think from that point of view, the where the electron comes from is, it's worth noting, but it's not the most important part. And even in a high carbon grid, really you're just looking at historical, yeah Victoria has a lot of brown coal plants but as you add more EVs you're actually going to be adding renewables at a faster rate so most of your new demand is actually going to be met by renewables anyway so it's, it's still a cleaner option. Um, yeah I guess for me it's more what are the alternatives because you've got Yes, I can drive an EV and that's pretty pretty efficient, but I could also catch a bus and maybe a, a diesel bus with 30 people might be better and that's probably a transport plan of questions or even better an electric or even a hydrogen bus potentially at some point. So yeah, that's why I'm a, a bit on the fence because there's alternatives other than private vehicles, yeah. I look at it from the customer perspective. So we did a survey in May this year and 60% of our members said that they would consider buying an EV as their next car. And one of the main reasons for that was for the impact on the climate. So it's quite interesting that people that, just general everyday people would think that it's a good thing to do yeah. for the climate. It's, it's interesting because we're flipping between the no and the yes mm -hmm. in each of the answers. And I think an argument for the yes is yes, it's better than what we currently have, but actually you get more carbon emissions from the brakes and the tyres than you do from the car itself. So that flits back to the no, which is we've got to have alternatives for people. But I guess going back, to, I'm going completely off piece, going back to the original question is, regardless of where the electron comes from, an electrified journey is better than an internal combustion journey, hmm. for example. Um, it might also be worth the yes camp. Anyone who responded yes, maybe there's an alternative view that we'd like to explore. Does anyone want to put their hand up and, yeah, you hit on the front? I almost said no because I thought perhaps you might include like aviation in, in, in the term transport. But as far as road transport's concerned, even in a grid that was completely powered by coal, it would still be cleaner than petroleum based vehicles because of the, like, the efficiency of the engines and the power plants. A petrol combustion engine is quite inefficient really, whereas even a coal power plant is actually quite efficient and built at an, an enormous scale. So as soon as you start to mix in renewables, it just gets better and better thereafter. So it's a, it's a pretty obvious proposition. I think you raised an interesting point that it's not just car travel, like airline travel, I don't know if you've got any kind of thoughts on airline travel or you mentioned, Rob, public transport, but I guess this is a mobility question. Um, I'd like to bring lived experiences to the table. So I've been on five flights in the last two weeks, which is why I look absolutely knackered. And I offset every one of my flights because that's the only way I can make my travel less carbon intensive currently with airlines. And that's a big issue for the industry starved of going, I live in Western Australia, so I was very starved of going any, anywhere for two and a half years, and it's time to get back to travel. And aviation is one of the biggest and hardest parts of our transport industry to decarbonize. There's ways to do it, there's different challenges with that. And one of the biggest issues is asset life. So a, a car, 10 years, 20 years, if you're really lucky and you look after it, a plane could be up to 50 or beyond. Big ships can be significantly more than that if they're well maintained. So the asset life is a really fundamental point and there's a big reason why aviation travel is where it is with its carbon intensity is because it's been really hard to engineer a system that works 
and worked 10 years ago or 15 years ago, so we're starting to see those in the industry. There's a point-to-point -point issue as well. Aviation, a plane doesn't just travel from Perth to Adelaide, it goes from Perth to Adelaide to Sydney to New Zealand to Thailand to Bali. It goes in a lot of places, and in order to make that a more decarbonized world, all of those points of call need to have a similar type of system, which is where sustainable aviation fuels comes in. Sustainable, and use my hands again, whether it's sustainable or not is a bigger question, and maybe we've not got time for that one. But yeah, that's my thought on airlines, is there's a longer lead time to make that work. Yeah, thank you. That's really good. I don't know if either of you have any, maybe not. I'll just probably look at it from the public transport perspective, that the way we commute's changed. We're working from home, we're more local. So the feedback we're getting from our members is that look at public transport options increase not everyone wants to go to the CBD anymore how do I get to my local shops how can I walk or catch an e-bike or do those things so it's a lot of education is required I think about how you can get from A to B and not always have to drive a car as well yeah I probably the only thing I was gonna say is yeah speaking about aviation one of the like difficult to decarbonize sectors but one of the good things about private transport and EVs is it's one of the easiest to decarbonise sectors. Like the, basically the two easiest things to, to decarbonise are the electricity grid, because renewables are really cheap to build now, and private motor vehicles where, yes, EVs are a little bit more expensive, but it's a much more attainable target than aviation, which is a really challenging one. I have a bit of a question to ask in this space. I think I have liberty to do that. In terms of, uh, Kerry, to your point with 60% of people wanting to buy an EV and a lot of that reason was to do with decarbonisation, so I'm wondering, do people get this feeling like an EV is going to be an environmental choice and therefore they might be more likely to buy an extra car or drive that bit further? And how might that play into actually worsening the number of cars built and things like that? I think people see the benefits from the climate perspective, but affordabilities are really expensive still. If you want one, then you've got to try and find one. There's a supply issue. Range anxiety, it's a big thing and people need a lot of education about how they fill up their EV. We have a technical in advice area, RAA, and we get inquiries about EVs, but we're actually getting more inquiries about how do I charge my car and how do I solve range anxiety than we are about what car I should actually buy, which is, I think that says it all in a way that it's such a big change for people. You, you no longer go to the petrol station to fill up your car. You have to think about where you're going to go and how you're going to how you're going to charge your car. Do you think price is going to be one of those deciding factors whether you get rid of that second car and consolidate? I think so. Yeah. yeah. But the, I think the price of EVs has to come down before people see that benefit of the running and maintenance costs outweighing the cost of buying an EV. Thank you so much. We might move on to the second question of the evening, if that's okay. So, electric vehicles help decarbonise transport, but do they help decarbonisation of the electricity grid? Pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> I feel like the nose. Oh, I was about to say the nose. Oh no. Oh, it switches. The top one I was going to say is always ahead, but I didn't realise it switches. It's about 50/50. There's. That's really interesting. So I'd really love to hear from the nose in the room. Is would someone who has said no please put their hand up? Who's willing to talk about it? Did anyone say no? I can't be, like, it's just a sceptic. I'm Helen, hi. That whilst the intent is to decarbonise transport, you might be introducing more carbonisation in the process of decarbonising transport. You shot yourself in the foot, like, in a sense. Thank you. And I think that's a very valid point. So it 
be interested to hear all your views. I could take this question in one direction, which perhaps we haven't got the time to go into, which is the raw materials to create an electric car that could probably come from a hole somewhere in Western Australia to make it. And I think that's part of the issue is that whilst we're, I know we're talking about decarbonizing the electricity grid, but the electricity grid currently needs supporting and stabilizing across all of Australia. And that requires a lot of poles and wires and dispersed generated energy and storage to make that work. And in order to build that, we need to build a lot more infrastructure over the next 10, 20 years than we have over the last 120 years. So in order to, in the no cam, is it helping to decarbonize the electricity grid in a way, yes it is, because it's helping us to push solar and renewables into the grid. But on the flip side of that, we need to pull out more raw materials from the earth to make that. So it, I'm completely in the middle, which is great to see this is roughly in the middle. Yeah, we see, I, I, I said before that we're getting lots of inquiries about home EV charging and about 85% of people that are inquiring actually have solar. So what they want to actually know is how do they make maximise the benefit of the solar with the EV and that's actually not that easy because uh, you've got all these different tech in people's homes, every home is set up differently so you, it's not a one size fits all because your solar system or your battery is different to your neighbours and tech doesn't just talk universally to all these things so it's about optimising so that people can maximise the benefits to a, get cheaper bills, because that's what they want, plus help the environment as well. But I think it's a 50-50 for me because it's about making things more affordable and also helping the climate as well. I'm on the yes side with this one. So uh, we touched on it a little bit before, but the fact, if we can add more load to the grid at times when there's more renewables in the grid or in a grid that has high renewables like in, in South Australia, that is going to help us build more renewables and progress to that fully 100% renewable energy, which, is, which has been a target in South Australia to achieve that by 2030. One of the challenges to build a 100% renewable grid that's based on wind and solar, which are variable sources, it's not like hydro when you can decide when you turn it on and off, is that the demand basically has to follow the supply then. Solar and wind are purely based on the weather. It's, you get solar when it's sunny and wind when it's windy. So you ha basically have to have this flip the grid where previously you basically used energy whenever you felt like it. You might get home at 5pm and plug your EV in if that was the case. And the grid supply, people would dial up their gas or coal power plants to meet demand. But it flips it. The energy instead is available when the weather conditions are suitable and demand will change to follow that. So I think the big part of the solution is we've got to be smart about when we're charging EVs. So you might come home and just plug your EV in when you get home at five and unplug it at seven the next morning. But you're going to have some smarts and some smart EV charger that's going to basically be putting energy into that car when the available energy is cheapest and greenest. But you need tech to do that though. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, we, education as and, well. and we, we sort of touched on before, there was, there was a sort of program about rolling out smart EV chargers and they're not, they're not incredibly expensive. We're talking $1,500 $100 when you're spending 50, sort of forty dollars to $50,000 on a car. It's not a huge additional cost and it's going to save people a massive amount because it's mm -hmm. going to mean they're not paying peak rates to buy their energy. But absolutely, it's got to be well managed and I think that's both on a government supporting things like smart EV charging and I know SA Power Networks are doing a lot of work in the space around paying people additional benefits if they sign up to do smart charging as well as energy retailers who are trying to change their model to support that as well. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, that's the biggest challenge is that every house is different and no two houses are the same and the tech that's inside the house is different, the switchboard's different and therefore getting that one solution that's going to fit every household is actually what the person that works that out is going to do very well because the tech that we've seen today there's not if you've got no solar or you've got solar and so or solar and a battery you actually need di different tech in your house to make sure you are charging at the right time i, I think we're, we're it, it's a great discussion and i think one of the biggest challenges is we're we're trying to apportion people's journeys or their assets or thoughts and residential is only a tiny proportion of transport emissions yes. and a, a transport ownership if you like so people's own car or their family car is a very small proportion of what the transport emissions are and one of the biggest challenges for Australia is to look at our giant fleets our industrial fleets our connections from the ports and the distribution centers and beyond 
That's the big fish. The little fish we're trying to challenge and change that, and there's a lot of different disparate policies all around Australia that are doing different things in different states, which is, I keep saying different, but that's my a summary of where Australia is at the moment. Without a coordinated national policy, we're not going to see a decarbonised grid. Mm. We're not going to see a fully electrified transport system because we've got disparate policies that are competing with each other in the residential market, as well as our freight and industry that we need to tackle very soon. Yeah, I'm interested in the point, Ben, you just raised there around uh, policy. And I wonder how regulation, when we're talking about different and different tech and everything being different, where does the you know, centralisation or decentralisation play into this? I still think we need a coordinated national electric vehicle strategy, which is coordinated with a complete overhaul of our grid and our electricity system. Now that's very controversial for someone from an engineering consultancy to say, but that is what I think Australia needs. What does it take to overhaul an electricity grid? For I'm not an expert in this field. Maybe you've got more insights into that than I do, but a lot of politics, a lot of money, and critically, moving away from that consumer provider model, which is a master and a slave model, which is you generate and I buy it off you. We're completely away from that, and we should be moving away from that, where you can generate your own electricity. And we've been able to for quite some time. Many of you, I'm sure, have solar on your roof. You can do that, but perhaps some of the pricing structures around that for you mean that you're still a master and a slave. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on transforming the entire energy grid, but the the big problem in terms of decarbonising the energy grid is like, you know, there's been a lot of lately about capacity mechanisms and some of the down in the weeds, but really we've just got to build a lot more bulk energy supply, a lot of solar and a lot of wind, so we can replace coal and gas. We're in the midst of an energy price crisis at the moment, which is largely caused by the coal mines are all flooded because of the wet weather on the east coast so we've switched to gas and there's a war in Europe so gas is in short supply and get, so both gas and coal are becoming incredibly expensive and we're still a grid nationally that's based mostly on gas and coal so when those inputs become expensive we've got expensive power crisis so if we can just build a lot more wind and solar that's there as bulk energy supply then we can that's where I think the big like national piece is to say let's get this into the grid and how we're going to do that whether that's extending the <coughs> renewable energy target or through a carbon mechanism carbon price mechanism or through new south wales has their renewable energy roadmap there's different ways to do it and probably a national approach but really building wind and solar farms is not that hard the technology is there you just get some land build to solar farm the engineering sort of problem has been solved and they're quite cheap we just need kind of policy certainty around it to get that in and then on the other side that's going to create cheaper energy and we can get our demand side of things around people using their rooftop solar buying from the grid to, to power you know, electric, an electrified grid. I guess one of the arguments that reasons why that hasn't been done is your shock on a month at the end of the month when you see your power bill and, people, and it goes back to the consumers and the retail side of it and people have shout to the politician and saying oh my this has gone up 10 percent and then all of a sudden it, nothing gets invested in and I think one of the biggest sticky plasters we can tear off in Australia is to stop that connection between where the retail price is and our actual infrastructure spend. And there's some giant projects in Australia in the 20 to 30 to 100 gigawatts of renewable power that are not going to go and feed into our grid. So there's some giant projects that are using Australia's incredible natural assets and not doing it to support the transition to a decarbonised grid, which is just frankly crazy from a renewables perspective that surely we've got the capability and capacity to build these incredible renewable sites, but nobody in Australia will benefit from that, from a decarbonised grid. Thank you. That was very interesting. We haven't heard from anyone from the yes side. I feel like we've covered a lot of things, but I still would like to hear if there's anyone in the audience who said yes to this answer. I felt this was almost a trick question, but I focused on the words decarbonisation of the electricity grid. There is no causal link specifically between electric vehicles and decarbonising the electricity grid. Electric vehicles could be powered by coal and by gas and by a trillion hamster wheels. But to Rob's point earlier, 
At the moment, solar and wind are by far the cheapest forms of renewable, of energy. And so if you are driving demand for electricity, then invariably what you're going to drive is the, the building and the uptake of more renewable investment. So for that reason, I thought, yeah, maybe those two are connected. You are driving renewable investment if you are increasing demand for electricity. Thank you. And I think that yeah, definitely tied into what Rob was saying. I don't know if anyone's got anything to add. Otherwise, I just I, when we're talking about solar and wind, I just want to raise... We have sp spoken about smart meters, but obviously in winter we don't get a huge amount of solar. How do the smart meters work and how does our grid cope when there's less renewables? Yeah. Yeah, so I get, yes, smart meters definitely an important part of the renewable transition. I guess the, the way the analog electricity metering system was built decades and decades ago was you essentially got a mechanical meter that counted up and spun a wheel for three months and someone came around and read it and said how much power you've used which didn't really speak to the time you were using it or the amount of renewables in the grid at the time so we want this kind of connection between using more renewable power and getting cheaper rates for doing so as well as being a two-way grid where you get paid to export to the grid smart meter infrastructure is pretty important in south australia where the, you know, large energy customers are 100% on smart meters and small customers, so small business and residential, are about, about one third of people have a smart meter. So it's a, it's a slow and steady transition. Uh, Victoria, a few years ago, did 100% smart meter rollout. So it's, yeah, I guess it's important tech for that kind of being part of that energy transition into, in a terms of like prosumer household that's both consuming from the grid and exporting to the grid. And yeah, I think there's a some bodies of work going on in South Australia to work out what's the best way to accelerate that uptake, whether we can get in five years, can we get to 100% smart meters, something like that as well. I'd just say from the consumer perspective, installing, if you get solar put in, you have to have a smart meter. And it's not an easy job sometimes to get a smart meter installed because the solar retailer will install the solar, but your energy retailer has to install the smart meter. So we'll go out and install the solar, but the energy retailer then has to install the smart meter and the solar doesn't work till the smart meter is installed. So it's install something on someone's roof and it's, that's nice but I can't use it because I'm waiting for the energy retailer. So it's not really a coordinated approach. So it's not great customer experience sometimes because customers sometimes wait two weeks, three weeks before the smart meter is installed and they don't really understand why. They've had these panels installed on their roof but they're not getting any benefit from them until the smart meter. Me, two weeks. So like, mm. what? It was so sunny. Yeah. So you, you, you can put that in statistics if you want and say that that's probably a couple hundred cows of carbon extraction that you just wasted because mm. you can't use it, mm. which is fascinating. It is fascinating. Um, absolutely fascinating. And mm. hence the complete overhaul of our <laughs> energy system yeah. to allow that connectivity between the two. From, you probably picked up from the accent, I'm not from Western Australia. And I probably had a smart meter in my home in England before moving here for 10 years or so. It was a really bad stage one smart meter, but at least it told me what time of day I was consuming that energy and a price structure to, to suit. And we're, we're in 2022 and we're still waiting for that smart meter rollout, which is a bit of a challenge. And that will help with adoption of electric vehicles because you'll know when best to charge and you'll also know when best to turn on the heater or the air conditioner or the washing and drying, which the first time you have a smart meter, if you've not got one, put the dryer on and watch your smart meter. It's scary. Put the air conditioner Put the air conditioner on, on and yeah, watch the smart scary. meter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's different tariffs. In South Australia, we've been on a flat tariff, whereas now we've got time of use tariffs. But a lot of customers don't know that they're available, they don't understand what that means, they don't understand that if you put your washing machine on overnight or cool the house down overnight, it's so much cheaper, or do it between 10 and 3, but most people just get their electricity bill and look at the price. They don't, they don't read it and they don't understand it. Yeah, there's a big, I guess, education piece mm -hmm. for consumers, I think, to as part, if, if we want to accelerate that smart meter rollout, you've got to do it in a way where 
you taking people on the journey and also yeah to your point about the solar installers being mismatched with the retailers yeah. i think that's just kind of endemic of like really bad technology that powers the solar industry and the retail energy industry this is someone hasn't spoken to someone else because that's pretty easy if you just have the meter installer turn up the same day as the solar installer you do it at the yeah. same time or the same person does both but there just hasn't been this kind of coordination because it's just not a uh, industry that's powered by technology that's like, okay, let's be smart here, let's schedule these two things to happen at once. And the frustrating thing for the customer is the solar retailer can order the smart meter for the customer, but they can't follow up where the smart meter is. They've got to go back to the customer and say, now you've got to call your retailer to find out why it's not installed, because they won't talk to the solar retailer. So the customer's just, this is ridiculous because I've got this installed and now I don't know what to do and we can't actually really help them. We can give advice and sometimes we do call the retailer and they do help us out, but hmm. the customer's supposed to call the retailer to find out why the smart meter hasn't yeah, been Yeah, that's installed. interesting. Thank you. There's just a, another aspect of this that we've touched on, but around equity and when we're talking about a lot of people are, are buying their own solar and then they have access to, to free electricity during the day. What about the people who don't own their own home or don't have the ability to buy their own solar panels? How's this going to influence them moving forward? I think I'll answer the first bit of the question first, which is the equity piece and sort of ownership around things. And I think it's quite relevant. I was shocked when I came into South Australia and saw petrol price at 157 when I left the airport. It's about 170 or so in Perth. It's about to go to 220 in Perth next week. That's because the giant subsidy that the government put on put fuel in order to keep equity in the system. It wasn't necessarily about the consumption or the challenge around consumption. It was about the equity piece is that somebody who heavily relies on getting to work and at a certain price point is living on a very edge of, of turning into a, a challenge for them to get to work would have really struggled with a very high fuel price. And I think one of the biggest challenges with equity is we've got to make sure that the, the electricity and the decarbonisation of the electricity system continues that equity journey. Get people away from price spikes and price hikes. Get people away from real resource challenges in oil and gas and get them to an electricity system that we can control the price of which is a big part of the challenge. But an electric car is still $60,000. Mm. Plus, I was in London and Europe a few weeks ago, and you can buy a small electric vehicle for less than $20,000 in Europe, which is quite a game changer. But then again, it doesn't retain, oh, sorry, it continues to retain its value for a lot longer. So the second-hand car market is coming into Europe. There isn't that much of a second-hand EV market in Australia, which is where a lot of people's potential transport options are in. Until we get there, we're going to struggle with equity. But I'll always end on this point with equity, which is the most vulnerable in society are the most reliant on public service. So public transport investment, a shift towards mobility as a service and connections to our cities through active transport and movement through that is by far the most important investment that we can do. We've looked to try and solve the issue for renters. Renters can't access solar unless the house that they rent has solar on it. We've done a lot of research. Landlords don't see the payback on putting solar on rental homes because there's not really a lot in it for them. And I think this is the same with the adoption of EVs. If you're in a rental, how are you going to charge your EV? The landlord isn't going to put a $2,000 charger in your home. They may in time, but while it's early adopter, no. And why should the renter put that in the home, knowing that in 12 months' time, they might be told to leave that house and they've invested all this money into their home. So I think equity is a big thing. Yeah, I guess there's two, two real challenges. People that, that rent not being able to benefit from the energy transition and also people that might own a home but don't have the, the ability to go out and buy an EV or a solar system. So I think there's probably a couple of things that can be done. These are the people that should be like most looked after by the government that are potentially left behind. I saw New South Wales today launched a program for people on pensions who get an, anyone that gets an energy concession. It's as you know, most states have had this for a long time. If you're on a pension or whatever, you can get a few hundred dollars a year from your energy retailer, basically credited from the government to you. People are allowed to roll their next 10 years of energy credit, so it might be 500 bucks for 10 years, $5,000 upfront payment 
to buy them a solar system up front, so that's government money, and it's actually going to save the person a lot more than that over their 10 years, and it's going to be like good for everyone. So I think sort of smart solutions like that, but also, yeah, for renters, I, I think there's probably partly a sort of government responsibility to make sure that landlords are looking after their tenants to some degree. I think a lot of renters struggle to even get a landlord to put in heating or cooling or something, let alone charger. But to have some sort of minimum standards or ability to say, no, this tenant, if they can get this. And then on the other side, it's probably like a private industry to see how the, that problem can be solved between tenant and landlord. So we're currently working on leasing solar and battery systems so that the tenant is only paying, they don't have to pay anything up front, the landlord pays nothing up front, they're paying a daily charge, which is less than they're going to be saving each day, the system's financed, and then if they move out two years later, the new tenant moves in and gets the benefit as well of that system, and the landlord's sort of got no loss, they're like, mm. great, you're saving money, it's, it's good for me, I've got solar on this roof, this property now. So I think it's a combination of like government and private solutions to get those things to happen. Thank you, really good. So we might move on to the third question now, if you could please put it up on the screen. So are we set up for widespread electrification of transport? Like it. <laughs> Straight in there. I think we, we know the answer now. Anyone in the room, because you've all answered the same, does anyone want to explain why they've answered no? Oh, we've got one yes. Hey, lots of things come to mind. There's a stigma against the transport means, public, private, trucks, trains, mining equipment, ships. So even if, like, every, even if every car is electric, there's the resources used to dig out minerals. Politics comes into it of where do the minerals come from, whether it's Australia or somewhere else, are we friends with them? Where does the energy come from? Is it solar on the roof? Is it wind, hydro, nuclear, something else? Carbon, okay, not carbon because we're electrifying. Plus if all transport's electrified, that doesn't guarantee that the way the energy comes from is all green, safe, etc. So, too many unanswered questions, in my opinion. Over to, over to you guys. Yeah, yeah, I was convinced. No, there we go, there is a yes. I did, I did see a yes a, a minute ago, but I think it's pretty clear that we've all said no. I think one of the things we've got to, we've got to think about is transport isn't just about plugging a car into a grid, into a wall socket, into a charger, it's much bigger than that. The consumption of transport is aviation, it's shipping, it's mining, it's the transportation of your Amazon Prime delivery to your front door. It's significantly more than just getting you to work and back and getting your kids to school and back. So the electrification of transport, are we set up for it? No, I don't think we are. But that's, that doesn't mean to say that we're not on the journey to electrifying transport. But it isn't just about your journey to work. It's much, much bigger than that. An electric car is also a hydrogen fuel cell car. So I'm bringing hydrogen. It's, where are we? Five minutes before the end and I've brought hydrogen in. And it's, it's part of the answer. It's a storage mechanism. It is part of the answer. But it doesn't necessarily require the same infrastructure that full electrification does. But it still requires electrons. So in order to make it work, so I'm fixing the question, we've got to build more solar and wind and renewables. Yeah, no, I agree. I think we all agree we're not set up for it. And really, it's about incentives as well. How are we going to incentivise not only consumers, but companies, businesses, government as well to change public transport and things like that to more electrified options? Because People don't generally change unless they see good in the change or there's a reward to change. So change just doesn't happen. There has to be reasons to change. Just one more point before you jump in is that I think I've got to put a layer of understanding on that when I say no. I think it's no today in South Australia today. Norway, 92% of all vehicle sales in Norway are electric vehicles. It's possible. We can do it. We're just not there yet. Yeah, I was going to say the same point as Ben. Like, we can't 
turn on, we can't do this tomorrow. But I don't think that those sort of tricky to decarbonise or tricky to electrify transport might sometimes be seen as a bit of a reason to do nothing. It's, there's actually heaps of low-hanging fruit that we could do a massive amount to electrify. The, yeah, as we said before, the easiest thing to electrify is private motor vehicle transport because most people drive short distances most of the time in their private vehicles. And yes, EVs cost a little bit more, but that cost will come out over time and we can subsidise them and look at different options to make that happen. So I think there's actually... a big chunk that's quite easy to do and we can we are set up to do it's not like you necessarily need to go okay let's get 100 percent renewable grid before we even start getting people with evs or we need these perfect smart charging solutions like from a personal level we've got an ev and it's just plugged into a 10 dollar chinese smart charger that only comes on during the sort of cheap winters it turns on at 10 a.m off at three on at 1 a.m and off again so that we're using energy at the cheaper times when there's no more renewables that's like a real like cheap easy solution to get i bought the cheapest sort of ev on the market at the time so we don't need the perfect before to make the perfect enemy of the good i guess is my point I guess we're talking a lot about home charges with EVs and I just want to, I guess, talk about if we're going to have EVs spread out in South Australia, what do we need to do to get to that point where people don't have range anxiety and also freight vehicles and other means of transport, public transport, things like that? Big question, sorry. It's a big question and I think one of the biggest challenges is we can't just think about SA, we've got to think about the whole country is that the freight doesn't, apart from during COVID, the freight just doesn't necessarily stay in SA. It travels beyond the connections to and through, and so do you. You'll be traveling to Melbourne tomorrow. It's important that we have a holistic national strategy for how we roll out EV charges for public consumption or public use and for freight and logistics as well. So a lot of freight and logistics is back to base operations. Most of the time, it's a case of a logistics hub that the truck does a trip and goes back to a, the same hub or another hub that's controlled by the same company. A lot of logistics is that way and there's ways to control how you roll out charging in those locations. Where it's different, where you don't go back to the same point and you've got to travel and traverse long distances and charge en route, that's where you need a national coordinated strategy to roll out charging. And it isn't just a small seven kilowatt plug-in charger, it's significant EV charging. So RAA won the tender with the government to roll out a public EV charging network. Over the next two years we're rolling out 140 locations and it's really been designed to those spots where you need to fill up, like you can't keep going if you've got an EV. So I think that's really interesting. We're going to be competing with petrol stations and the EV charges will be at motels and caravan parks. So it's just a different way of doing things. You could go to a caravan park and you'll plug your car in overnight. It's, it's just a change in behaviour. EV charging is going to be very different to filling up with petrol, that's for sure. Did you know there's a public toilet strategy? The, the public toilet strategy was about regional towns and regional town tourism, is that if you wanted to go in a public toilet, chances are it's in a regional town. So I encourage you to go to the toilet in the regional town, which meant when you finished going to the toilet, you went and bought a coffee at the shop next door. EV charging can be the same sort of regeneration opportunity, rather than templates dropping it into a petrol station where there's, it's a soulless environment and you're there to spend money in the little shop that, that consumes all of your chocolate habits and <laughs> Coke, everything else. So it can be very different. Yep. We've just not had that strategy to do that yet. And it is going to be different. I think the, from what I know, the majority of the stations we're putting in are not in petrol stations. They're in caravan parks, hotels and on highways. So they're, they're more of a destination I think they're looking at where they near public toilets and things like that because it, it's not a five-minute exercise to charge up your car. Yeah, I think, I guess it's worth noting that the vast majority of EV charging is going to happen in the home, but it's really important for those one, two, three, five percent of the times when you can't charge at home, when you are going on that one trip you do to Melbourne or Sydney, you're mm -hmm. in your car or you're going on a road trip or you get that one time where you're caught short and you've had to drive a bit further and you're running out, like you ha the network's got to be there, yeah. even though we know my most EV charging is going to happen when people are at home on the weekend overnight, the network is super important and 
it needs to have that different sort of layers to it. So you might be, you charge for an hour while you're doing your, your shopping at a seven kilowatt, but you also, when you do your long distance trip, you're going to have to do a full tank charge. And we were talking before about having that one megawatt charger that's going to charge your EV in five minutes to full again. So you, it's almost a petrol station. You stop once to get to Melbourne or Sydney. And that's, they have massively different challenges between the home charger, the sort of district, your supermarket, maybe level charger, and then what you're going to do on a long distance road trip. So it's, I guess, having that network and that kind of different layered approach. Yeah. Yeah. Ernst Young did a, a study recently and in Europe they've estimated there's going to be 130 million EVs on the road. To service that, there'll be 9 million public charges and 56 home charges. So predominantly 80 to 85 per cent of people will charge at home, not while they're out. Mm. Really interesting. Thank you. Someone did respond yes. So I just want to give anyone an opportunity. Dan. <laughs> Thanks, I Irene. Mean, I've responded yes partly to offer a contrarian opinion, but I think it depends how you look at it, right? So, yeah, the technology, the challenges, the supply chains, not mature enough. The economics maybe doesn't stack up. But those are all reasons, not always the reason why something good doesn't happen. More often than not, it's the political will, the community sentiment, the business will. So I think in terms of the sort of our broader society and that, that fabric, we are set up for the first time ever for electric, electrification of transport. We've got a new government that's supportive of it. We've clearly got a community that wants it and businesses behind it. And I think they're probably the greater impediments to electrification rather than the technology, which will mature, the supply chains will evolve, we'll solve those problems. But it's not always, if we haven't got the community behind it or the political will, even if we solve those challenges, it wouldn't happen. So. Thanks, Dan. I think that's a very interesting point around the, yeah, the political will and the community will. I don't know if any of you have got any thoughts on that. I think if you gave that opinion probably four months ago, five months ago, whenever the election was. It would be a very different response, I think, from me. I think we're getting there towards the political will to make this something that we should invest in. I think perhaps we didn't have that in the past, and I think that shows you how quickly that sentiment can change. I think, was it today that the bill went to Parliament on how climate, or the Climate Action Plan? That's going to challenge, I'm sure it was today, that's going to challenge how we've looked at this as a whole nation i'm going to really going to change what we're going to do in future so that political will i think has changed significantly it, are we set up for widespread electrification of transport i think we are now and um, from five months ago we probably weren't any anyone else had any comments Otherwise yeah i guess just on yeah on the political front it's just in, for businesses just want certainty that there's going to be some sort of continuity policy and there's a political will that things are going to things are going to happen so i think it's good to have a federal government where there is a sort of a more ambitious renewable energy target and decarbonisation target. And I guess, yeah, or governments, the biggest thing for business is just a continuity of policy. So we're not having, we're having battery subsidies uh, one time and then we get rid of them or EV. But this sort of chopping changing just creates risk for business and you're like, why would we do anything if governments are just going to sort of flip things back and forth all the time? So I think that's important to have a bit of a bipartisan sort of push to have continuity and, and support that. That wraps up our sort of question and answer session. We've got a few more minutes left, so I'd like to open up to some questions. I do have one online that we've got some people in online. The question, is it true that producing the batteries for the electric car is negatively impacting the carbon footprint and it takes up to five years or more to drive electric cars to make up for that? Hence, we're hardly gaining ground. I don't know about the exact numbers, but obviously there's a fairly hefty input, energy input to creating batteries, but even five years, typical car that drives 10,000 kilometres a year, that's only 50,000 k's in five years. And EVs that have been around a bit longer, like the Teslas are doing 400,000 kilometres before their battery needs replacement. So that's still an eight times return, even if you have to drive 50 to get back to even, you're getting another seven times that in, in the future. And as the grid gets more renewable power, then that input cost is mostly coming from yours anyway. So I don't think I think there's a good point that we that natural resources are limited, but I don't think that should be a reason to do nothing. And also, on the counterpoint, the amount of resources to drill up oil to make petrol is massive as well. Yeah, I guess we've got to look at both sides. You have to look at the whole supply chain. 
so it, it isn't necessarily just the holes that are dug somewhere in Western Australia or in Chile or in Queensland and then that raw material extracted and taken elsewhere that's part of the supply chain of a battery but the part of the supply chain of petrol is significantly worse than a battery so from that side you've got to look at what vehicle it is they're very different it can be anywhere between two and five years to get the payback from a carbon perspective if you go onto a, a certain EV manufacturer's supplier website and have a look it'll tell you the whole life cycle carbon cost of your car which go on to BMW and try and buy a brand new 3 series with a combustion engine it won't tell you the carbon cost uh, for that car for its whole life cycle because it will be very different and skewed in the direction that you're thinking. Yeah, thank I'm not you. going to tell you yeah. a vehicle <laughs> manufacturer because they might shout at me but mm -hmm. okay. yeah no thank you. Are there any have you got anything to add to that Kerry sorry? I'll just say running and maintenance costs of an EV are a lot lower as well so you've got to factor everything into it it's better for the environment. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions in the room? If we're talking widespread electrification, is that conversation also including the rise of driverless and the various models that might be rolled out? Great question. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with the uh, Bus Drivers Union in Victoria, uh, not that long ago, was electrification the first step to automation and very worried about jobs, very worried about their sort of livelihood, which is a bus driver. And obviously really interesting points, really interesting conversation and is that automation will come, a version of automation will come, a version of automation is still in your car, even though sometimes in the Australian models it's switched off. It, it will come, there's some regulation that perhaps needs to change in Australia to allow that to happen. But full automation of full driverless cars is a very long time away, 10 to 15 years plus on Australian roads for your residential, I can't say residential, your personal journeys. Is You are very much more likely to get on an autonomous train or an autonomous bus than you are to have your own autonomous car. So yes, it's coming and electrification helps that as a system because then everything's drive by wire and it makes things a lot easier to do, but it's not gonna turn up tomorrow. Well, but yeah, there's autonomous trials happening, but there's a lot to learn and before it's mainstream, that's for sure. I just had a question about things. I saw today that Jet, is it Jetstar? No, I think it was Rex. Somebody was doing electric engines in their plane, I saw announced today. So just a question about that, anything much about it? And then also biofuels for aviation, if that's gonna be some assistance? Yep, electrification of planes is a really interesting area. The problem is, as if anybody who's driven an EV would know they're a lot heavier than an internal combustion engine. So for aviation, that doesn't help at all. So for battery aviation, it's gonna be quite a while before, before we get there. You're talking light vehicles or light aircraft where that's probably possible and short hop. So you're not gonna look at long haul battery aviation. So one of the challenges with that is of course, having going back to the model of stopping on a five hour flight, you probably get, have to stop once or twice which is not something that consumers would want, I'm sure, because it'd take longer. So that's my view on electric aviation, even though it's really exciting, because it's quiet and you don't necessarily have to have massive headphones on to keep everybody... Calm. The other side of that question was biofuels and synthetic, so that's the sustainable aviation fuel opportunities that, that the whole industry is looking at, from Rolls-Royce, who potentially make the engines all the way through to the airlines and the airports, and sustainable aviation fuel I call it sustainable because sometimes it's not sustainable, it's just better than what they've currently got. So there's a whole question on biofuel and the, the question is food versus fuel. So biofuel comes from things that you can eat and can con consume in a very different way to using it as fuel. So I don't think biofuel is the full answer. A synthetic version of fuel that's made perhaps from hydrogen and carbon that's consumed in a very different way, that's possibly the answer. 
Rob, do you have anything to add? I feel like you're used by fuel bike. Yeah, not in, a, in an aviation sense, but the yeah, I guess it's a, I guess one of the things about aeroplanes is they've got to carry their fuel with them from start to, to end. So the even like long haul flight, the further you go, not only do you have to have ca carry more fuel to get further, but you've got to carry more fuel just to power the more fuel and weight you're carrying. So it becomes a real challenge, and with heavy uh, batteries, that is is really. An issue, so yeah, electrified long haul aviation is almost so far off to being solved. But yeah, I definitely think for those short trips, and I don't know what's short is short, but maybe even intercity like a sort of Sydney to Melbourne, which is I think one of the most trafficked air routes in the world, and like Sydney to Brisbane up there as well. So like maybe for pushing those is like where the big winds are there, and then to save that biofuel for those really areas where you need it, and then. Even other areas where biofuels and things that compete with agriculture and making sure that we're not wasting that opportunity and we're using, basically using things for their best use case. So long haul aviation, we know that we can't really electrify that. Let's do that, but let's maybe not use biofuel in cars which can be electrified and that sort of thing. Time for one more question, if there's anything in the audience. No, another one from you, yeah. <laughs> the question about hovercrafts. It's a, it, if we're talking about carbon emissions, I don't think I've ever answered a question on hovercraft. If we're talking about carbon emissions, brakes and tyres give off more harmful emissions than a, an exhaust pipe. So brakes and tyres are still on an electric car and they still give off harmful nitrous oxide, which will kill you and your children and everybody else around you because it's very toxic. An electric car and the, and the challenges with electric cars, the manufacturers of electric cars are very aware of this fact and that they're, they're really investing in just, just more sustainable tyres, more sustainable brakes. Actually, an electric car can brake better using its motor than it can its brakes. So you don't use brakes that much and you don't give off that. Often. So there's a lot of advancements in that. Related to the hovercraft is it doesn't have tires, it does have brakes. They're not very good, but they, it does have a brake somehow. But in a tail for a hovercraft, it's full of rubber. And rubber's made from fossil fuels. In a, some, it, the rubberized material is made from fossil fuels. I probably don't have anything to say specifically about hovercraft, but it did make me think about other modes of transport that we haven't really touched on at all. And you know, things like e-bikes and e-scooters are like actually really important ways that people get around and, and are quite cheap and a way to electrify transport and do things. And it's, I think it's really important area to have more bike lanes and abilities to get around some e-bikes. And even e-scooters, we have a sort of insane kind of regulation here where there's two companies in SA that are allowed to have e-scooters and you've got to pay a few bucks to go around the corner with the pink or the blue scooters. But you can't actually go and buy and own your own scooter. Someone got fined... $4,000 the other day for riding their scooter down their street. But just some really sensible regulation and things to encourage people to electrify transport in ways, in addition to like private vehicles, there's, there's other ways to get around. If you can take a scooter and that's going to encourage you to scoot to the train station and get a train into the, the office rather than driving or whatever, then I think it's a sort of good option for people. No, it's definitely a good point. Electric bikes, you can ride further, you can ride up steeper hills, people with less ability can ride, so there's a whole lot of increased mobility that people can achieve with electric bikes. I'm all for that as well. So thank you very much for your time. This has been a really interesting session. Thanks everyone for coming along, everyone online. I think there's some drinks and some nibbles still, so please feel free to stick around for a chat. Thank you.